Okay, well, so uh, welcome to session number two, contributing paper session number two. This is Interventions in Science, the Market and the Military. Um, uh, and Sanjuja uh, from UC San Diego is going to kick us off. And uh, Bradley from UC Dallas is going to uh, be the second paper. Whenever you are, are you ready? commercialization of science fall. On the one hand, there are, as the authors call them, the Mertonian Tories who subscribe to the Mertonian ideal of science, constituted by uh, the norms communalism, universalism, disinterestedness, or originality, and skepticism, or organized skepticism. To them, commercializa commercialization corrupts and detracts science as a unique and invaluable knowledge-seeking endeavor. On the other hand, there are those who believe that commercialization is an inevitable result of technology transfer from the university to external enterprises, such as corporate companies, yet see the producers or the universities and the consumers or the firms uh, as persisting relatively unscathed through the process of commercialization. The authors call the second group of people economic weights. According to them, neither of these positions work, for they both ignore what the authors refer to as a fundamental restructuring of pharmaceutical science. The central aim for them is to then triangulate and find a third, more viable position while pushing contract research organizations to take the center stage in the discussion. In trying to develop a third position by triangulating between the Mertonian Tories on the one hand and the economic Whigs on the other, which they call Triggish, uh, Mirowski and Van Horn argue that in debates about the privatization of science, it is imperative to take into account the ongoing changes in the very structure of science. According to them, both the Tories and the Whigs wrongly focus largely on the university, while the former lament that the increased involvement of outsiders to the university in science is resulting in, in a compromise in scientific integrity uh, due to loss of free shared public knowledge, etc. The latter hold that the university and its outsiders can happily coexist, uh, with the university being the primary site of knowledge production and the outsiders being mere consumers of this knowledge. The authors posit that science is increasingly becoming multi-local, fuzzing the boundaries of knowledge production, and hence also of research standards between the university and the corporate sphere, and hence has been undergoing a fundamental restructuring. And this phenomenon, they argue, has been unequivocally exemplified by the contract research organizations, or CROs. To them, CROs, uh, which are service organizations that provide outsourced research services to pharmaceutical companies, represent a paradigm of privatized science that deserve immediate and keen attention in order that we gain a proper understanding of how privatized science works today. Um, while Murawski and Van Horn argue convincingly that universities have been relative latecomers in the privatization game, and that other new extra-academic social structures have been key players, which both the Tories and the Whigs ignore, I contend that this descriptive approach is inadequate and problematic at multiple levels. Firstly, both the Tories and the Whigs' positions are non-literate. 
So if one wants to find a third position that responds to them and contributes better to the debate, it should at least suggest some normative standards for science. Secondly, there is too much at stake for any account of commercialization of science to be agnostic or non-committal about norms in science. The science studies literature is replete with case studies that show that commercialization is not without consequences. The Tory and outcry, although probably a bit conservative, is a legitimate one. Uh, Mirowski and Manon approached their triggish story by first pointing out problems with the following conventional accounts of the rise of CRMs in the last few decades. Firstly, pharmaceutical companies wanted to increase efficiency and cut down their costs. They wanted to minimize the time and money spent on FDA mandated drug development and testing process uh, so as to maximize them for patent protection. CROs came to the pharmaceutical company's rescue. Since they did not play by the rules of academic science, the focus was on speedy delivery and there was a ruthlessness in terminating un unpromising trials, thereby increasing cost efficiency. A second explanation is that CROs helped globalize the pharmaceutical industry. They helped provide relevant cross-cultural expertise in international clinical studies and cut down the time required to find both investigators and patients and so encouraged the clinical trials to proceed with relative celerity under diverse sets of uh, regulatory circumstances. circumstances. Uh, according to Murawski and Van Horn, uh, these canonical explanations that attribute the rise of CROs to external economic factors are far from accurate, for they ignore even the possibility that the rise of CROs was a result of the very restructuring of pharmaceutical research itself. They attempt to support this view by focusing in turn on how privatization is played out in five fundamentally constitutive areas uh, that they say medical and legal literatures discuss. I discuss three of them here. Uh, confidentiality and disclosure. While university administrators were traditionally not too concerned with regulation and policy in the open science of the university, with increased privatization, there has been an overall increase in pressure to accept restrictions on proprietary information both inside and outside the university, particularly in the industry. Moreover, the authors say, scientific results are produced in a context-specific manner on, on demand. Since CROs are answerable to the companies they work for, the commitment is not to some ideal scientific truth, uh, but to the immediate goals of the companies. Also, conflict of interest is no longer a straightforward term. For CRO researchers, their interests, their interests and those of the company are often so intertwined in their minds, with the latter more often than not curbing the former, probably even unconsciously, that it becomes hard for them to even discern a bias in their thinking or approaches. Uh, restructuring of publication. Authors often don't admit complete ownership over their writing due to lack of agreement over methods used in trials, etc. This is in contrast with the traditional academic authorship. Also, often ghostwriters are hired uh, who are at least intellectually invested in what they write. So sci uh, scientific literature gets produced from your monetary gains. And the, la the third one, uh, the last one, reordering of goals of scientific research. The authors argue that it is not just the process of science, but also the products that have come to wear a privatized face. Uh, they contend that both the Tories and the Whigs uh, make the mistake of treating the products of science, as it is done today, as generic knowledge, uh, indifferent to the uses to which it might be put. Unfruitful trials being promptly aborted by pharmaceutical companies, as opposed to the open-ended uh, research in academia, and the production of copycat drugs, passing them off as new drugs in the market, are two examples of this phenomenon. The central point uh, Mirowski and Van Horn want to make um, is that the above are not signs of individual biases and special interests or self-serving rationale of a few people, but rather are signs of the changing face of pharmaceutical research itself, as exemplified by the lack of awareness of conflict of interest in the CRO researcher uh, discussed earlier. As a consequence, they say such conflicts cannot be rectified by and further don't even warrant some code of ethics or intervention by academic committees. According to them, there are inbuilt means of disciplining the system, but what these means are, they do not spell out. But the puzzling part is here. Referring to the rise of CROs and the associated developments discussed so far, they say, quote, if we avoid viewing these phenomena as the, du as the dubious behaviors of a few misguided individuals or transgressions of the terminally greedy and instead approach them as structural changes in the organization of science, then it will become possible to regard them as harbingers of the future of private science. 
But is there really a necessary dichotomy between dubious behaviors and structural reorganization of science? While the former is about value judgment, the latter is plain description. They may be right that it's descriptively inaccurate to characterize the conflicts as caused by dubious behaviors of a few individuals, but that doesn't automatically preclude a systemic dubiousness. What the structural reorganization seems to be hinting at are some serious systemic ethical problems, if not ethical problems at the level of individuals. What Mirosky and Manhau need to do in order to meet their goals spelled out above, that is to triangulate and find the middle ground between the Tories and the Whigs position, is either A, find a third position which is also normative, for a third position that is intended to mediate between the two cannot be altogether different in kind, but only different in degree, or B, give a cogent argument that in light of the triggish account, a normative position is strictly not possible. The problem with their account is that they do neither. In fact, at many points in the paper, they give some very provocative descriptions that clearly beg for some normative standards, but they stop short of any such description. For instance, coercion on patients to undergo trials in the developing world, which would be unthinkable in the developed world. The pronouncement, um, the pronouncement that abortion of unfavorable trials often lead to callous and cynical treatment of patient populations, um, and to not go with wherever lines of inquiry may lead, etc. For them, simple measures to ensure or restore objectivity and confidence could not begin to rectify the situation. Again, this reference to norms is perfunctory, and they don't suggest alternatives to the simple, uh, to the simple measures that they talk of. Um, all this is quite reminiscent of the idea of mode two science we briefly heard about in the earlier session, introduced by Gibbons et al. in 1994, although there are important differences into which I won't go here. While mode one represents the traditional mode where knowledge was produced in highly disciplinary contexts, uh, and was highly institutionalized, was hierarchical in the sense that knowledge passed down from the hegemonic scientific community to the rest of society, um, and homogenous. In the new trends referred to as mode two, knowledge is being produced in highly application-specific contexts, transcends disciplines, and hence it's transdisciplinary, heterarchical, and is heterogeneous. In mode two, there are multiple loci where science is being done, not just the university, but think tanks, governmental agencies, corporate organizations, etc. And so the knowledge being produced is subject to multiple constraints. The context of application itself brings with it interests of various actors involved. So when it comes to the quality control of research, they argue that quality in mode two is no longer uh, determined solely based on conditions dis decided by disciplinary peers, as was the case in mode one, but by a host of additional considerations, applicability, practical efficiency, profit, market competit competitiveness, etc. But what is crucial to their arguments about quality control is that insofar as, as the core of mode two knowledge remains scientific or technological in nature, it is imperative to continue to uphold criteria of mode one quality control decided by disciplinary peers, although this is not sufficient for mode two in light of the additional uh, factors that I just mentioned. Of course, Mirovsky and Manhorn would argue that according to Triggs like themselves, the core of mode two knowledge remaining scientific or technological as given it all, a picture it itself is farcical, and that hence upholding mode one ideals is an impossibility. For to them, the outputs of privatized science differ in kind from those of the traditional academic science. In my view, firstly, even if we do agree that the core of mode two knowledge remains scientific or technological, Gibbons et al. are wrong in thinking that mode one and mode two quality control can happily coexist. In reality, they don't. More often than not, mode one quality control suffers due to mode two quality control. The so-called necessary conditions are no longer upheld, and science gets misappropriated to suit the needs of certain interest groups. And this is exemplified by several case studies in the science studies literature. Secondly, in response to Murawski and Van Horn, uh, I return to the point I've been emphasizing. The nature of science or scientific knowledge being different between the present privatized scene and the more traditional academic sector does not pre preclude us from seeking any new revised or improved uh, norms. While it is clear that we do need some standardized norms in place, even for privatized science, the question is what level of normativity are we aiming for? Methodological, epistemological, institutional? As Howard Smokler um, has suggested, I think they're all interrelated. People just for me, yeah. if you repeat those criteria, you just mentioned them very rapidly. Um, the methodological. Oh, methodological, epistemological, or institutional. And I follow Howard's... Methodological epistemology, 
methodological, A, methodological, B, epistemological, C, institutional. What's that middle one? Epistemological. Epistemological. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard something else. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so as, as Howard Smocker suggested, I think they are interrelated. He pushes for a quasi-causal relationship between institutional or social values on the one hand and methodological values on the other. He says, quote, norms which prohibit fraud uphold the value of communalism. Uh, this is going back to Watonian norms, sorry. Um, the system, norms and practice of peer review promotes the values of emotional neutrality and disinterestedness as well, perhaps, as others. The methodological norms and practices of science also serve to promote these overarching values of science. The rule of total evidence introduced uh, into inductive logic by Rudolf Carnap serves the value of rationality, while that of falsifiability, to take an example which is drawn from Karl Popper, serves uh, that of organized skepticism. The question, of course, is which of these are relevant to privatized science? While Mertonian norms do seem uh, a little too ideal for this post-academic science, as John Zimmel puts it, I do believe that we can still uphold some revised version of the norms to suit the face of privatized science. Although I'm not sure what exactly they would look like, I believe we must nevertheless attempt to formulate such norms. Let's briefly revisit each of them with, sorry, with, uh, with interest rapidly, uh, sorry, with internet rapidly breaking geographical boundaries, it seems possible to maintain universalism which is one of the key Mertonian norms. As Sheldon Krimsky says, moving on, moving on to another Mertonian norm, uh, patents may restrict scientific communication for a designated period of time, after which they must be fully disclosed. In this sense, patents are not inconsistent with communitarian values of science. But in the face of individual gains and incentives for scientists in the face of privatized research, complete communalism might be unachievable. Disinterestedness, the next of Merton, Merton's norms, is of key concern too. That research is often bent to meet the needs of just a few bodies or individuals, like funding agencies, is certainly not without consequences. Just because this is a systemic feature of privatized science, it does not mean uh, it does not mean that we resign to embrace it wholly. As Zimmel has argued, loss of disinterestedness also significantly reduces public trust in science. As for originality the next of Merton's norms. It is clear that phenomena like that of copycat drugs, which I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, drugs, drugs only slightly different from composition from existing ones, passing off as new ones in the market and being awarded patents, grossly undermines originality, and I think that such a trend, that such a trend is reprehensible is quite self-evident. The bottom line is that the fact that science has changed vastly at the descriptive level is not by itself an argument for ignoring traditional norms. We need to ask the further question of whether such a change is welcome and to what extent. Further, all the Murawski and Van Horn uh, stress repeatedly that the ethical issues, if I may call them so, with privatized science don't lie in a few individual researchers but in the system itself. They don't provide even a minimal picture of what kind of relationship might exist between the individual and the system. I want to argue that even if trends like ghostwriting are systemic trends, the role of individuals does not disappear altogether. After all, it's some individuals who legislate and make decisions and keep the system going. This being the case, it would not be such an obsolete or irrelevant step to turn to epistemology. I think virtue epistemology is particularly re relevant. According to virtue epistemology, epistemology is a normative endeavor, and intellectual agents and communities are the primary source of epistemic value and the primary focus of epistemic evaluation. According to responsibilism, a, a popular theory in virtue epistemology, which I think is quite relevant here, the active nature of the knower is emphasized. The knower is now recognized to be part of the epistemic community uh, with all the moral and, in, and intellectual obligations that this entails. James Montmarquit has conceptualized virtue epistemology slightly differently. Rather than thinking of intellectual virtues as cognitive faculties or abilities, he conceives them as personality traits, such as impartiality and intellectual courage. It seems only reasonable to expect scientific practitioners, no matter where they work, the academy, a pharmaceutical company, or a CRO to adopt such epistemic virtues and be epistemically responsible for themselves and the community at large. For instance, if a CRO researcher were a careful thinker striving to be intellectually impartial, she would most certainly come to realize 
if she were producing research knowledge that was influenced by some vested interests of the company and conflicted with her own interests. Of course, ultimately, no amount of theorizing on norms for science will help if actions of a scientist are fundamentally at odds with her beliefs. That would just be plain unethical. Thank you. So we'll, we'll do combined Q&A at the end. So let's go on to Brad's uh, presentation. <clears throat> okay, my research uh, was looking at the uses of intellectual knowledge, primarily social science and counterinsurgency operations um, in Afghanistan primarily and sort of the late war in Iraq. Um, my central point is that the ethical implications of doing social science, primarily anthropology is what's being uh, garnered in these operations. But I sort of amalgamate the issues of ethics and applicable to all social sciences, and that the militarized social science being produced uh, for these operations are part and parcel. Uh, they're against what the code of ethics would be to not only primarily the associations like the American Anthropological Association, American Sociological Association, and so on. Um, I utilize several concepts, but uh, the main theories that I use are from Michel Foucault, his concept of securitization and making securitization objects. Uh, security as a policy initiative is about defining what is a security risk. Um, this is connected to his concept of biopolitical power. Um, in which case, hu human lives and everything that has to do with distinctly human elements become objects of political policy. This has to do with humans and populations in other countries being made as objects of political segregation and pacification, which I'll get to in a minute. This is tied to the sociologist Zygmunt Bauman's distinction between the, roles of the role of intellectuals within modernity and post-modernity. Um, I use those phrases not as much to adopt it in the strong sense that he conceives of it, but to distinctly show the two role differences. Uh, biopower is the recasting of all uh, aspects of human life as objects of political classification and subordination. Um, through this, distinct categories can be made uh, that will have the negative side effect of strengthening differences within populations, biases, uh, racial behaviors. Uh, when these populations are controlled from a top-down, state-centric model. Uh, this control is directly associated with the ability to frame modern political economic and social structures as ahistorical and universal. So when you think of the phrase American exceptionalism, it should be thought of in, as not a a sort of psychological thought pattern put nationwide, but more as the systematic acceptance of modern institutions as if they have no history, as if they're outside of history and the values inherent in them uh, would be universal values, making it harder and harder to escape um, the national-centric view that America has. Um, and thus relates to the power to create the other. Um, subjective subjectivities are created by dominant power holders. Um, in this case, the American state is one of the largest ones in international politics. Um, two roles of intellectuals I use is um, to distinguish the two types of uh, intellectual roles between policy intellectuals, this is a very strict dichotomy, which isn't completely realizable, but for this presentation, it's to show a distinction of what Sigma Bauman calls legislators, uh, who you would think more of a policy uh, analyst, 
someone who would uphold dominant institutions, but may not necessarily criticize these. Um, his second role would be as interpreters, he calls them. And these would be more of an academic-based intellectual, one who would crit critically assess modern institutions for the basic inherent goal, or the perceived goal, of relating this knowledge to public spheres in what Antonio Gramsci would think of as fostering a healthy public sphere, uh, public common sense. The processes of the militarization of social science, which take part primarily in other countries, are also the same sort of systematic militarization of processes that are also, uh, also embedded in our society here. Um, to draw the distinction is, as it has in the literature between domestic and international, is to some degree a failure of conceptualization, um, especially when the international sphere is becoming embedded in the domestic sphere. There almost is, there's less of a difference between domestic and international policies when militariz militarization and militarized policies are used more and more to deal with domestic social problems. Um, and what used to be rephrased as social problems are now considered small-scale conflicts. Or if you think of disorderly conduct in cities, they're now conceivably thought of in the same way as minor skirmishes of insurgents. And the same sort of dealt with in the exact same manners. Um, this is related to the concept of militarism, which is the adoption of values that would be uh, associated with a with the uh, acceptance of the use of the use of military as a strategy also comes with the acceptance of certain values. This has less to do with the actual institution of the military as much as a subordination of, to some degree, being American. The, the militarization of American culture is done with the acceptance of national values of patriotism and an ability to not critique these institutions to some degree because they're seen as supra brand. But they're seen as above the civil society's critique to a certain degree, but maybe not outside of the critique of academics, which is where this, these values become incongruent. Uh, the state and civil sphere are legitimated through its ability to respond to political and social matters with military force. Um, I'm drawing upon literature from Julian Reed, uh, the international uh, uh, political scientist, who uh, notes that uh, that more and more political and social problems that the spheres themselves and institutions gain legitimacy by their ability to use military concepts and actions. They, they in turn, it shows the, the subordinated relationship between, say, the police, as in reference to the military, when conceivably thinking of getting the job done, so to speak. Um, Domestic public spaces, accordingly, are constantly under surveillance and populations are pacified in order to lessen civilian resistance militarization. Here I'm using terms from the literature, um, which may sound harsh, but the, the surveillance of populations puts what would conceivably be a natural order to cities and urban spaces. Um, it's the ability to think of these things as naturalized that has caused them to be so embedded in our everyday lives. Um, and, and to get to my uh, main point, counterinsurgency uh, involves the systematic 
uh, reconstruction of native populations in order to lessen the possibility of any insurgencies. Um, you can plan for insurgencies, but the methods implied are always there. So if you say uh, the theorist Giorgio Agamben talks about making zones of distinction and indistinction, whereby populations are segregated into different zones and thought of as safe or dangerous. Intellectuals are the creators of these typologies. Um, intellectuals have the responsibility at this point um, to, well, they are given, they are put into the place of responsibility and have many have accepted it. Um, to make these typologies and to really fundamentally reconstruct what these populations consist of. Um, what is conceivably thought of as temporary or was thought of as temporary at one point is not in the public discourse any more than it is in political science theories when we're in the age of whether it's real or not talking about perpetual war. Perpetual war means a perpetual security threat here and in other nations. Um, what you have is a constantly shifting securitization problem. Um, and it's always trying to be nailed down by one methodology or another. Currently, um, people like David Petraeus and other military intellectuals have conceived of counterinsurgencies as the bridging between social science the, the knowledge of social science and the ability to understand populations with strict military tacticians. So you want to lessen violence, obviously. This is a point of using more social science. They call it weaponizing culture. Um, their, one of their main points is to lessen body counts, you know, which is a very, very crude way of putting it, but that's the way it is put. It's to lessen violence, honestly. It has very little to do with the construction of liberated populations, which is conceivably counter to um, what are primarily anthropologists who are arguing that this is in complete contradiction to their ability, how, how anthropology uh, promotes the, the enhancement of the quality of life of populations, along with the study of populations, it has less to do with the uses that they are pacifying these populations. Um, in the case of the human terrain system, anthropologists are on the field. They will be go-betweens uh, between the soldiers on the field, sometimes the military heads who are not directly on the field, and the populations themselves. The idea is to promote good relationships. In effect, what it has done, besides make social scientific research, which is at best questionable um, for its lack of peer review, it is also promoting the pacification of populations, which I mentioned, which really just limits their political power and limits their, mobile, their movement. Um, some theorists have talked about the fact that these populations are considered stable because they don't move. You, you put them in within zones, you restructure their food lines and their resources, you can conceivably also make checks on security threats. But that can only happen once you've fundamentally restructured their native populations. Um, Speaking of scientific literature, which that is one problem uh, academics also have, which I didn't touch much on, but it is there, is that the literature produced is of what conceivably subpar quality because it is not peer reviewed. Um, at best, it was reviewed by a board of military academics, um, but not in the same capacity that it would be reviewed in the university setting. Um, Whereas military operations usually look for discrete answers to complex problems, social scientists actually are wary of simplistic definitions of problems. 
this would seem alien to a social scientist to think of discrete dichotomies of dangerous, safe, or um, citizen enemy. These are strange dichotomies to a social scientist, but not to a military tactician that has to run basic strategies to know quickly what is a population that is a target and one that is an ally of some sort. <clears throat> These, uh, as I've stated, these actions result in the biopolitical reconstitution of native populations. Um, people become securitization threats, and uh, in turn, so do groups. Uh, the segregation of groups is, is, as I said, for the level of pacification, whether or not it has beneficial results, it has lowered the body count. We have at least solve that, um, leading to other problems, of course. Um, the theorist Julian Reed notes that what this ultimately does is not only significantly uh, confirm the security of America, but also other liberal democratic regimes. Uh, the theorist Henry Grew uh, notes a human pedagogy, which he calls it, um, an education theory, which to me sounded very similar to Zygmunt Bauman's notion of the interpreter. This person would, would use the academic setting, the university, to critically assess these modern institutions in a way that hopefully will reach the other spheres and ultimately maybe even pierce the sphere of military uh, action in a way that this merger of social science and military has not yet done uh, clearly. Those, these are my, some of my references. There okay, well, um, we have uh, plenty of time for discussion. So, um, uh, questions for our for our panelists. For both? For, for either, yeah. Or both. I'll start off. Yeah. Um, for both of you, I guess, would it make sense to just approach your questions by saying, I'm a recent PhD in science, or anthropology, or whatever, and a company wants to hire me, or the military wants to hire me? and then say, under what conditions would that term of agreement be acceptable? Mm -hmm. um, and then you'd say, from there, I'm getting at the norms. So in other words, and this is what I think Merton was doing, is say, look at what's happening to Nazi science, and what's happening to Lysenkoism, and, and, and Soviet Russia. It's no longer science. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not science any longer, because it's not following these norms. So when I identify these norms, I'm identifying, in, in a sense, the essence of science. I, the way I learned that. So can't you just sort of, from the bottom up, say, yes, you could work for a company as long as you're doing X, Y, and Z and not doing A, B, and C, say, and there I've got it. Those are the norms that must be in place if it's going to be signed. Is, is that too simplistic to think of it that way? No, I think the, uh, the literature I read of academics such as Henry Rowe or David Price would be another one, uh, <coughs> very defensive. Um, but they do note that, yes, the individual choice is there uh, if you want to look at your specific norms and in the institution. I think that they were getting at a possible alteration, seemingly, at least in my case, the merger of social science with military actions is conceivably an alteration of the structure of the institution of the military. The way people are resisting this is by saying, well, if you can change, why it, that's not what social science is. That is still what the military is. So, and you're right. That's uh, my point was it's not going to be science, but I mean, there, there is a personal choice there. Obviously. Yeah. So the, the your human pedagogy or whatever idea that was it sounded to me like let's retreat to the ivory tower and write our scholarly articles and hope that some general reads it. And isn't it better just? To say, look, I realize I'm going to get my hands dirty, sure. but only in engaging here, sure. 
as long as I don't violate certain, like I say, core norms, um, I can have better effects on, because I mean, there are these militarization is going on regardless right, of what a little anthropologist does. But couldn't I have more of a chance of influencing that if I feel like that's somehow a professional responsibility mm -hmm. to look after these people who are being militarized in some way? Sure. Better put me, and I've read some op-eds from anthropologists that say, that have been in human training systems, and they sure. say, fine for you to criticize me from your faculty lounge, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm here trying to do something good. Yeah. yeah and putting my life on the line, by the sure. way. Yeah. Right? They've been killing someone. Yeah, three of the yeah. Yeah. So, isn't that just kind of an excuse, this, these ideas that, oh, we don't want to get our hands dirty, so I'll just sort of hope that somehow yeah, I, I think with that, you're supposed to uh, seek a policy route that will give you some sort of communication. If you're just spouting from from the universities, and it, notably Henry Brew is very defensible of the university, um, probably to a naive quality, believes it to be a sort of value, a, a really open, much more of an open site of knowledge production than maybe I would agree with. Um, as far as like, yeah, if if you're just leaving it within the academic realm, then yeah, it looks like you're, you're just arguing without any sort of flexibility. Um, I didn't run into many options around that. I would believe that the best option would be to find a policy route um, and change this, but as yet, it's being decided by Congress solely, um, who have all but tanked this program and limited the money to the Minerva Initiative for research that would be based from the universities, and then, uh, which is its own interest, its own problem. But as it is, Congress is making those decisions, even academic ones, where in the case of the Minerva Initiative, they, they decided that there was not enough research on ideologies of insurgencies. That's a very specific thing, and uh, that's, that, so it's not the university or the military, but apparently it's Congress doing most of the decision making. Can they respond to that in the dialogue? You asked a very important question. Uh, out of college, uh, I worked with at and I was, called into the military, we tested nuclear weapons in the Pacific and Nevada. Okay. Now I'm going to give you some, you were under the military. One of the first things you learn is, it's not the desires of the individual, it's the needs of the military. Yes, sir. Then, I uh, left that, I went back to Bell Telephone, then I became a clergyman. So that was a different balance system. I'm glad I didn't go in as a chaplain. Because when you see what a chaplain conflicts on, you're there to support the commander. Now, we had some real basic. Then my denomination wanted us to get interdisciplinary. So I'm a psychologist, a pretty hard post person. I know what my colleagues go through when they serve as psychologists. They are used. So are physicians. So are engineers. You know, for now I'm going to balance it. I taught public policy for, for 30 years. And I taught it here because I've seen far too many articles by people, you know, professionals, writing very good articles. Then they, and I've seen them present in Washington. They get to the end, there's public policy implications to this, and they don't know how to do it. So you're in fields where I think the big challenge is to how to convey 
your discoveries and findings and values to the power structure. And if you don't know how, they just ignore you. If you know how to talk their language, you can get some way, but it's going to be different from what you know. But keep at it. As long as that tension is there, it's going to change some of these So it's a real important thing. I'm glad you're touching on it. You know where you got speaking the truth to power? Oh, yes, I, I ripped off there. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to give um, Sanjuja a chance to respond to the original question. Yeah, um, I, I agree with most of the points that have been made, but one thing that I wanted to point out is that it's not, I, I think it's not so much of an issue of definition. You can call it science, not science, big science, new science, um, whatever. But I think the core issue is that there is a need for some kind of norms. And I think I don't think that Mertonian norms are completely obsolete or completely inapplicable today. So, um, yeah, but I just wanted to make that observation that it's not so much of an issue of definition or categorization of science and what science and what's not science. Irrespective of issues of categorization or definition, the question is what kind of norms are required and what kind of norms can work. So I, I guess I wanted to push you a little bit on what kind of norms you're looking for, because it seems to me that uh, Merton's norms are primar primarily institutional or organizational norms, right? Um, organized skepticism is, is completely an organizational norm. Disinterestedness, he acknowledges that individuals are not going to be disinterested, but it sort of somehow uh, ends up becoming disinterested at the level of the community or something like that. So, but toward the end of, your, end, end of your talk, with your introduction of virtue epistemology, it seems like you were going in a different direction, where you're searching more for individual norms. So tell me a little bit more about what exactly you're, you're looking for. Yeah, um, I don't have a very robust <coughs> picture of what kind of norms we have to work in progress. But broadly, my, my answer to your question is that we are faced with a diverse set of problem situations. And I think to respond, we have to look at to respond to them, we have to look at a diverse set of solutions. And I think we can look at we can look for solutions at different levels, at the level of epistemology, at the level of methodology, at the level of organization or institution. And I think all of these are not completely separate. Right. I think they're all right. tied together, which is what I was trying to uh, get to at the end, the end of the talk. Um, <coughs> Mertoli norms, like you said, are largely um, about the institution and organization. But like I said, I don't think that focus on the individual is completely irrelevant or not important, um, which is why I went the virtue epistemology direction. Um, I mean, at the bottom of it, it's still knowledge production. And the, so I think it, it, there's some value in addressing it at the grassroots level, which is the level of epistemology. And uh, the, 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 the version of epistemology that I saw as quickly lending itself to these problems is virtue epistemology since it kind of bridges epistemology and ethics of knowing, if I can put it that way. Sure. I think we should look at multiple levels. Seems to me there, there are kind of two types of questions that go through both of these presentations. Uh, one type of question is a question about the proper norms of um, inquiry and the, the standards for judging quality. And then there's a second question which is related, but I think it's in some way separate, which is the application of, uh, of, of research. So for the case of privatization, um, it, uh, you might actually think that the norms of good science are fairly similar, whether you're working in a traditional, professionalized, peer-reviewed type uh, atmosphere or for a private company. What counts as a good pharmaceutical research may not actually differ that much. The practice may be differences. Uh, but, of course, you might have some concerns about the application of that research in a privatized setting. Like, you have to, 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 to not be available to others. It might 
impede uh, picking research and so on and so forth. For, for the, the, the case of securitization and biopolitics, I mean, one, one thing you're doing, I think, in your talk is, is you're taking a very sort of strong fundamental market position. You seem to be saying that the purpose of social science is to do some sort of critical theory, to unmask different types of structure, uh, sorry, power structures, <coughs> domination, securitization, uh, uh, different types of categories, classifications, uh, which, of course, is controversial. I'm guessing that most anthropologists working in the U.S. military would actually reject oh, yeah. that model. They'd say, well, wait a second, you know, we're reducing the body count. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, raises kind of a really interesting question for application. Because here's the thing. I mean, if you want to be relevant to policymakers, you can't really try out government governmentability and biopolitics and, uh, you know, say this is what, uh, you know, the Frankfurt School uh, uh, tells us. Uh, but so it raises two separate, separate types of questions. And one is what should researchers be doing in their primary academic work? And then what is the relation to the further set of questions? I think they're, 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 they're separate. And you might even say, I guess in your case, that, hey, wait a second, we ought to be critical theorists. But then say, look, in the real world where things are pretty lousy, critical theory doesn't go over. Uh, and then it's actually quite, quite a complicated question about you know, what, what should be done. So I, I just uh, thought it was something you know, kind of interesting in both uh, uh, talks and uh, maybe more of a comment than a question. It's interesting that you think that they're so separate because increasingly the, what we're hearing in, in science studies is, is that the boundaries are blurring between application and like, pure or basic or fundamental research, um, which is what Mirosky and Reinhardt, people that I cited in my talk, have been pushing for, like, and even all the talk about Move to Science. Um, so they say that there's no really clear demarcation now in the face of present research between application and like, basic research. Because science is not, it's not like science is being done in the universities and being passed on to the rest of society, but science, this, sci, science itself is becoming multi-local. It's being done. It's, it's, it's being as much, scientific knowledge is being as much produced in a think tank as it is in a university. So, um, I think there are really kind of interesting questions about how you know, different institutions interact and you know, different practices. Sure. I mean, I think the fact that practices aren't, you know, there aren't clear demarcations. Doesn't mean there aren't useful demarcations. And, you know, we can still make a distinction between, you know, being funded publicly in the university to do your research and being funded privately. Sure. Now, I, I agree this things blur. Uh, but I, I think, you know, we, we, we need to do, I, I think here's, here's the thing. I mean, when we start looking at how things mesh together, we often get to the point where we can't make no type of normal judgments we have to make, and I think uh, there, there's a danger there. And there's still more discussions there. Fred, did you have any response? Um, but it, admittedly, my research involves the resistance side of this, so yeah, it's going to sound kind of very critical of it. So admittedly, the, the research that is being so heavily inundated is responses to this. And such, so much of mine did that it couldn't help but color my pride. I think it's, it might be helpful too to my reading the history of science is what science is distinct from myth because science is normative. I think the norms go right to the core of what we mean by science. The myth is just sort of repeat, repeating a story, whereas science is trying to, to appeal to nature and the the functional features of the things around here. So it's evidence-based. So that raises the primary question of what are the norms guiding a legitimate use of evidence to derive some knowledge from? And I think that's really what's at stake. I haven't read Murawski's work. I listened to him at 4S. But Merchants of Doubt, not Naomi Murawski's work, uh, what she's telling, the story she's telling there is that, that we're, gonna, we're losing that because people are are passing off as scientific, as normative, as knowledge, was in fact just myth or interest, right? So I'm going to hire you scientists at the tobacco company, and what you're going to do actually is make up stuff 
and give it the commanding guard of science or nature. Right? And that's, I think, what's at stake, isn't it? So I was surprised to hear you say it's, this isn't really about the science, because I think it is about the definition of science, because if we aren't clear about what's going to count as scientific, um, then it's really a choose your own reality world. And if you want to hear reality A, you, you choose this science. And if you want reality B, it's that science. And Republican science and democratic science. And, uh, that's, isn't that, that's what's at stake, I think. If I'm reading you right. Yeah. And sure. I think I, you're right, Merton's not outdated. I, I agree. Um, I think I slightly, um, I, think, I think we were talking about slightly different things when, yeah. I, now I understand better okay. what you meant by that question. What I was going for was uh, this descriptive approach bothers me. Uh, if, you're, if you're talking about categorization or definition of science from a purely descriptive approach, uh, I think that's inadequate. In that, at that level, it doesn't matter. But you seem to be pushing for, we actually seem to be saying the same thing, you seem to be pushing for the description, for the, sorry, distinction between some, what science, what comes in science and what doesn't, from a normative approach. Sure. You're saying, so, I mean, you know, this is right, something is better than something else. So I think that, uh, from that yeah. approach, the distinction definitely makes sense. It is important to make a distinction between what counts as science and what doesn't. But Maybe because of my background of Borowski and went on and moved to and all of that. Yeah. I thought you were just going for purely descriptive. No, no, no. I, yeah. yeah, sure. I, I think the normative is descriptive, though. Because we're talking about, we're characterizing activity in terms of the norms that guide the practitioners of that activity. Mm -hmm. So you're describing it through norms. I, I don't see a distinction there. You know, it's like, this is the way Aristotle talks about things. What's the telos of something, or the essence of it is to say, what is cheerleading about? Is it about jumping, just jumping up and down and doing tricks, or is it about running up the crowd? And you have to answer that question to know who's going to be allowed to that institution. Mm -hmm. So if somebody in a wheelchair, can they be a cheerleader? Mm -hmm. Well, not if it's about jumping up and down, mm -hmm. but if it's about pumping up the crowd, I'm sure they are. Mm -hmm. Same, I think, with science. Yeah. Who's, gonna, who's allowed to it hinges on what norms, what activities, what virtues. This is where virtue epistemology might come what virtues are appropriate to this institution. And I think Merton is still useful. I think virtue epistemology is a good way to go with it. But I think I'm with you. I just would challenge the normative descriptive dichotomy to begin with. Because laying out the norms is describing the activity. Mm -hmm. I would say. Right. Um, I just want to very briefly ask, um, and for both of you, is is the need for secrecy one of the problems that's, that's twisting the practice, right? So you pointed at the lack of real peer review. I'm assuming secrecy, the need for secrecy is part of that, right? So the, sort of some kind of internal panels are reviewing it rather than getting, putting it out. Uh, maybe that's not the case in that. Particular and then, again, commercial edge services has been one of the discussion points. That's been one of the biggest problems uh, I know with the Risk or the Pat Robertson, uh, I can't it, but uh, the, the PRISP program, it's like the Pat Robertson ISP, I can't remember what the rest of it is, but that one, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the criteria is that, yeah, you go to a form of sort of camp, I guess, and you're kind of taught how to do science under this program specifically, and one of those is you don't talk. And um, I guess that is, that's an issue with the people I read, definitely. I didn't touch on it, but that was definitely something that was making academics who do look, I guess, at the university as the primary site of knowledge production. Mm -hmm. Or I guess what they see is less loaded with policy imperatives. But yeah, that was, that was definitely a problem with a lot of people. Well, I think that's right at our end of our time, so let's thank our speakers. I commend you for doing this. I mean, it's an exercise, and you've invested sweat and tears into it. But it's going to—it's going to be very important. This is